On May the 2nd, 1945, Berlin's resistance was smashed and the red flag was hoisted over the German capital, the flag of victory. Berlin had capitulated. From their holes and hiding places, the German generals emerged, like beasts ferreted out of their lairs. Whole divisions, regiments, field police battalions, all the remnants of the defeated and shattered German army laid down their arms. Goering gave himself up. Keitel surrendered. Danitz was caught. Goebbels preferred to shoot himself. But the dragnet closed around Yodel and Rippentrop. Now the major war criminals were in the hands of justice. It was decided to try them in Nuremberg. Nuremberg, once the cradle of German fascism. Nuremberg, where the Nazis ran rampant. Nuremberg, from which the demented Hitler, Elias Corporal Schuckelgruber, hurled his threats at the world. Nuremberg now lies in ruins and ashes. It is symbolized by this disabled German in the deserted stadium. A philosophical lesson of history a lesson which future aggressors would do well to remember. For the aggressors of yesterday are now in the Nuremberg prison, awaiting the decision of their fate. The beast has been driven into the cage of the Nuremberg prison. Ribbentrop's cell. Keitel's cell. Goering's cell. Only yesterday the beast was still raging at liberty. It was from Nuremberg and from Munich that the Nazis began their marauding march. Only to finish up in the prison of Nuremberg. This is their last march, their march into the dock. Here, they were brought to answer for their crimes, these warmongers and conspirers against nations, these butchers of whole peoples and plunderers of whole states, these child murderers and slave traders, these 20th century Huns. For all this, they must now answer. Don't hide your face, Goering. All the world knows you, and the world curses you. The hour of reckoning has come. March to the dock, where your black deeds will be revealed. Soldiers of the Soviet Army, they have come from Stalingrad to stand guard in Nuremberg. The International Tribunal sat for many months. A Vaskanism was set up for the trial, and hundreds of persons helped to further the cause of justice. The courtroom in Nuremberg. Here, the freedom-loving nations will try the major German war criminals. Not from motives of vengeance, but that the great ends of justice may be served. The story of the monstrous fascist conspiracy against peace, liberty and democracy must be told. The criminals must be named and made to bear the punishment of their guilt.
the world must be warned. A whole library of damning documents was assembled by the prosecution. Here, the documents of the Soviet prosecution were kept. Their contents are now known to the world. The laboratory, where thousands of photostats were made. And the machines on which the copies of the documents were made. Here, the works of the Nazi leaders were gathered. Never before, perhaps, had such frenzied and bloodthirsty ravings come off the printing presses. Soviet artist Boris Efimov. And the Kukranixi trio, whose ruthless pencils had already exposed and pilloried the criminals in their caricatures. Soviet journalist Ilya Ehrenberg, Sevolod Ivanov, Sevolod Vishnevsky. The Soviet telegraph room where the reports of the trial were transmitted to the Soviet press. A sound record was made of all the proceedings of the trial. In the British telegraph room, men of the Signals Corps indefatigably tapped out the endless press messages. Photographs of the trial were radioed to all parts of the world. Every word spoken at the trial was at once translated into four languages, Russian, English, French and German. The world listened with strained attention as the trial unfolded. And the world waited waited impatiently for justice to be done. The trial was held in the Nuremberg Palace of Justice, a building that seemed to have been deliberately saved from the ravages of war in order that fascism might be tried. The court is coming. Court has come. The court of the nations. And into the courtroom will come the martyrs of Majdanek and Asvensin. From the ditch of Kerch, the dead will rise. They will rise from the graves. They will rise from the flames bringing with them the acrid smoke and the deathly odor of scorched and martyred Europe. And the children, they too will come, stern and merciless. The butchers had no pity on them. Now the victims will judge the butchers. Today, every drop of spilt innocent blood will speak for itself. And every wrinkle will call for retribution. Today the tear of the child is the judge. The grief of the mother is the prosecutor. Oh, what a long and painful road judges and prosecutors had to plod to reach this courtroom. Before fascism could be tried, it had to be vanquished. Hitler's countless hordes swept on, seemingly irresistible, until the Red Army struck and struck again and emerged victorious. Through horror and death came the victors judges and prosecutors.
the wounded leaning on their comrades pressed onward. The dead, before they dropped, bequeathed the call for retribution to the living and marched on, invisible in the ranks of the living. In the forests of Belarusia, the guerrillas joined the soldiers. Across Yugoslavia's mountain summits came Tito's dauntless warriors. Living and dead have come here to judge. They sit invisible in the courtroom, but the criminals see and hear them and tremble. The hour of reckoning has come. The International Military Tribunal, in the name of the freedom-loving nations, is sitting in judgment of the Nazi criminals. Chief Judge for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Major General Nikitschenko. His Deputy, Lieutenant Colonel Volchkov. Chief Judge for the United Kingdom. His Deputy, Sir Norman Burkett. Chief Judge for the United States of America, Francis Biddle. His Deputy, Parker. Chief Judge for the Republic of France, de Fabre. His Deputy, Falco. The court is presided over by Lord Justice Lawrence. Among the distinguished visitors, Vyshinsky, Deputy Foreign Minister of the USSR, and Gorshenin, Soviet Prosecutor General. The criminals are accused of general conspiracy, of crimes against peace, of crimes of war, of crimes against humanity. The prisoner's dock. Hermann Goering, Hitler's close friend, formerly known as the second man in the Reich. He is much thinner and shrunken now. Goering looked a different man at the height of his power. He was sleek and obese then. It was his airmen that bombed Warsaw, Leningrad and London. Goering was the founder of the notorious Gestapo. He helped to draw up and carry out the plan of attack on the USSR. Goering is criminal number one. Rudolf Hess, leader of the Nazi party and Hitler's deputy. He summoned the Germans to prepare for war. Guns instead of butter, he cried. Joachim von Rippentrop, Reich's Minister for Foreign Affairs. With the cunning of a fox, he was a past master in international intrigue. He was always ready to vow eternal friendship. But there was not a vow he did not violate nor a nation he did not betray, and betray again. He was the right and left hand of the warmongers. Wilhelm Keitel, commander of Germany's armed forces. I am just a soldier, he says, trying to disavow his guilt. But this is not the face of a soldier, it's the face of a hangman and butcher. His uniform is stained with the blood of disarmed and defenseless people. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, Chief of the Security Police and the SD. He is responsible for the gas chambers and gas wagons, the death factories and the concentration camps. On his conscience is the blood of thousands and thousands of innocent people tortured to death and buried alive in the Ukraine, Belarusia and the Baltic states. Alfred Rosenberg, the author of the race theory, which was to drench Europe in blood. He drew up the plan for the division of the USSR. Then he was made Minister of the Ostland, and by his orders, Poland, the Ukraine, Belarusia and the Caucasus were ravaged and plundered and put to fire and sword. The Superman is nervous now. Hans Frank, the cynical butcher of Poland. He called Poland a booty land. He said the country must be reduced to a pile of ruins. Poles and Ukrainians must be turned into mincemeat, and as to the Jew, 
They must be destroyed, every one of them. Wilhelm Frick, Reich's Minister of the Interior and Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, a snarling, vicious jackal, now caught by the tail and locked in a cage. Julia Streicher, editor of the Sturmer, one of the vilest new sheets in the world. Jew Beta, preacher of anti-Semitism, corrupter of youth. He proudly called himself Jew Hater Number One. Walter Funk, he was one of Germany's economic bosses. He supplied the means to run Hitler's marauding war. And the war supplied the means to line the pockets of Funk, Krupp, and the other German bankers and industrialists. Hjalmar Schacht, he directed the finances and the economy of the piratical Nazi state. Grand Admiral Dönitz, chieftain of the Nazi pirates. His wolf packs sunk unarmed ships and neutral vessels without warning. When Hitler saw that the game was up, he entrusted Dönitz with the task of saving the Nazi ship. But the ship went to the bottom, and Dönitz is now in the prisoner's dock. Erich Rede, he and Hitler conceived the idea of wiping Leningrad off the face of the earth. They failed, but the grief and suffering of Leningrad, its blood and sacrifices, call for expiation. Baldur von Schirach, his ideal was, we will raise up the youths of Germany to be cruel and ruthless. The whole world will tremble before them. I want to see the glint of the wild beast in their eyes. Fritz Zaukel, the slave trader. Girls of the Ukraine, youths of France, children of Czechoslovakia, look at him now. It was he that drove you like cattle to the slave markets of Germany. Alfred Jodl, Hitler's military advisor, bloodthirsty and ruthless and an implacable foe of the Soviet people. The Russians should be hanged, head downwards, he said. The world will not breathe freely until he is hanging head downwards. Franz von Papen, as vain as a peacock, a master of espionage, sabotage and intrigue. It was he that put Germany into Hitler's hands. Arthur Zeiss Inkwart, butcher of Poland, Austria and the Netherlands. Albert Speer, Reich's Minister of Armaments, in Speer's underground munition factories, thousands upon thousands of men and women toiled and slaved until they grew blind, died of exhaustion or pined away. Konstantin von Neurath, Nazi diplomat with the rank of a general of the SS, butcher of Czechoslovakia. Hans Fritsche, Goebbels' assistant, who like him poisoned the mines with a venom of lies and calumny. Such is the roster of the major German war criminals who broke all the laws of humanity in their attempt to impose their monstrous rule of violence and rapine on the world. And these are their defendants in their medieval robes who will argue and finesse and cite them in defense of lawlessness. They will claim that the tribunal of the nations has no legal power to judge crimes against nations. They will try to divide its councils anti-Soviet slanders and inenduos. What is the blood of the martyrs to them? They will try to save fascism. This is fascism's last line of defense, but it too will prove futile. After another, the prosecutors came forward to state the case against the criminals. The first to speak was Robert Jackson. In the prisoner's dark twenty odd broken men, reproached by the humiliation of those they have led, almost as bitterly as by the desolation of those they have attacked, their personal capacity for evil is forever past. It is hard now to perceive in these miserable men as captives 
the power by which as Nazi leaders they once dominated much of the world and terrified most of it. We will show them to be living symbols of racial hatreds, of terrorism and violence, and of the arrogance and cruelty of power. They are symbols of fierce nationalisms and of militarism, of intrigue and war-making, which have embroiled Europe generation after generation, crushing its manhood, destroying its homes, and impoverishing its life. Civilization can afford no compromise with the social forces which would gain renewed strength if we deal ambiguously or indecisively. Step by step, the prosecution unfolded the story of the Nazi conspiracy against peace and humanity. The early days of Nazism. The first stormtroopers. You have forgotten this, Rudolf Hess. You are suffering from loss of memory. One moment, we will help you to remember. Do you hear that bestial roar? Do you see these nocturnal frenzies? This demented worship of fire? This wild animal triumph? You remember now, Hess. But there were obstacles in the way of the fascist beast. Man and his ideas and ideals. Culture. Books. And so the books went hurling into the flames. And the savages danced and sang. Suppose the world does lie in ruins. To hell with it, we say. Tomorrow the whole world will be ours, as Germany is today. Hitler became Germany's Führer, and also the servant of his masters, the Armament Kings. It was von Papen that put Hitler in power, and obligingly resigned to him the post of Reich Chancellor. Hindenburg, before retiring to his grave, gave Hitler his blessing. Banker Schacht acted as intermediary. And the capitalists poured lavish funds into the treasury of the Nazi party. And Krupp, the merchant of death, the real master of Germany, okayed Hitler as the ruler of the Reich. Here they are, a charming family portrait. Bankers hobnobbing with the aggressors. And so everything that breathed of freedom and honesty in Germany was crushed, smothered, trampled upon. The stormtroops became the rulers of Berlin streets. Germany was surrounded in barbed wire. Barbed wire was henceforth to become the symbol of Germany. February the 8th was a big day at the trial. The courtroom was filled to overflowing. Not a single seat was empty. Defense counsel were tense and anxious. The criminals betrayed signs of nervousness. That day, the Soviet prosecution was to open its case. Chief prosecutor for the USSR, R.A. Rudenko. Your worships. I begin my speech, which will wind up the opening speeches of the chief prosecutors in this trial with a full and deep sense of the historical import of the occasion. This is the first time in the history of the world that crimes of such magnitude and with consequences so prodigious have come under the consideration of justice. This is the first time that criminals who seized whole states and turn their own state into an instrument of their crimes have been brought to trial. This is the first time that we here are trying not only the criminals themselves but the criminal institutions and organizations they founded and the theories and ideas of hatred which they disseminated in furtherance of crimes they had long been nurturing against peace and humanity. The day has come 
when the nations of the world are demanding stern retribution of the Nazi butchers, are demanding the stern punishment of the criminals. All the villainies committed by the Nazi major war criminals, jointly and severally, will be weighed by us with scrupulous care and attention, as is demanded by the law, by the charter of the International Military Tribunal, by justice and by our consciences. The Soviet prosecution showed and demonstrated how the Nazis secretly prepared for world war. Everything was bent to this purpose. Von Schirach's puppies playing with toy daggers. These are still youths and only carrying spades. But these are already soldiers. And the German women are already rubbing their hands in greedy anticipation of the parcels to come from the east. These are only dummy houses. These are still peaceful Germans. But the muzzles of the guns have already been raised. Wars of aggression are begun by treaties of friendship signed by the aggressor's diplomats. Von Ribbentrop, that traveling salesman of death, wandered through Europe signing pacts of peace and giving instructions to his spies and fermenters of war. This is the original of the agreement concluded between Ribbentrop and Himmler for coordination of espionage work. This is a letter from Kaltenbrunner asking Ribbentrop for a million Tumans for espionage activities in Persia. And the ink on the last pact of non-aggression was hardly dry when the German hordes were already on the march. Only the Soviet Union warned the world of the deadly danger of fascist aggression. But the Munich appeasers bowed and scraped before the aggressors and threw open the gates of Europe to them. Hitler and Keitel set about refashioning the map of the world. Frontier gates were smashed. Boundaries were violated. Vows and pacts were dishonored. And the brown plague began to spread through Europe. The secret plans of aggression were now put into operation. The green plan for the perfidious attack on Czechoslovakia. It was signed by Jodl. The Soviet prosecution at the trial exposed the way the world war was prepared. Goering's bombs began dropping on the cities of Europe. Warsaw is in flames. These are the fruits of Munich. Germany's panzer forces invaded country after country. Unprepared for war and deceived by their own governments, European capitals surrender to the Huns. For the Germans, it was just a pleasant promenade through the continent. We see them entering betrayed Paris, betrayed by Renault and Deladier. The sufferings of German-occupied France were recounted by the French prosecutor. Can the nations of the world forget this lesson? The German marauders were active on the high seas as well as on land. The British prosecutor, Sir Hartley Shawcross, told of this in detail.
Ernest's men were known to the world as pirates. His U-boats began applying their wolf pack tactics. They carried their piratical activities even into neutral waters. They attacked unarmed vessels and hospital ships. Here is a torpedoed ocean steamer, and not a man of the crew will escape. For Dennis' orders are not to pick up survivors, and the drowning are left to their fate. Dennis thanking his pirates. Your Worships, I shall now proceed to the crimes committed by the Nazi aggressors against my country against the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. On June the 22nd, 1941, Hitler Germany treacherously attacked the USSR. But this date does not mark the beginning of the realization of Hitler Germany's aggressive plans against the Soviet Union. The accused Keitel has testified that Hitler intended to attack the USSR at the end of 1940. And the plan for the attack had been worked out even earlier, in the spring of 1940. This is confirmed by the testimony of the accused Yodl, who during his interrogation stated that the plans for the attack on the USSR were given concrete and detailed form in November and December 1940. Yodl is referring to the document known as Case Barbarossa. This document is signed by Hitler, Yodl and Keitel. The Barbarossa plan envisaged the lightning destruction of the Soviet armies in the very first week of hostilities. The main blows were to be delivered against Leningrad, Moscow and Kiev. And the objective was the Archangel Astrakhan line. As the German general staff conceived it, when the German armies had reached the Volga, the Soviet Union will have been completely demolished. The aggressors were tantalized by the unbounded expanses of our country. Their eyes had long been fixed on our land, our oil, our coal, our natural wealth. In the early hours of June the 22nd, 1941, without declaring war, and without any excuse for war, the Nazis fell upon our country. Belarusian cottages went up in flames. Bombs rained down on Ukrainian towns. They thought they were taking an easy and pleasant promenade through Russia, that Russia, like Holland, would drop on her knees. Alfred Rosenberg had his plan ready for the dismemberment of the USSR. This is Rosenberg's signature. Hitler appointed Rosenberg Reich Minister of the Occupied Eastern Territories. Rosenberg's plan was to liquidate the USSR as an independent state, to deport the Russians to Siberia. The Baltic states were to be Germanized. Belarusia was to become a German province and the Ukraine a German colony. The Germans were to lay their hands on the oil of the Caucasus. Rosenberg made the plans. Keitel sent the troops, and then Himmler became to set up the new order. Himmler in Minsk. Himmler visits a concentration camp. Those are our people behind the barbed wire. Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians. Himmler is satisfied. The wild beast has driven man into a cage.
Himmler gloating over the ruins. This was Minsk before the war, before Himmler came. Those were our towns, in which our gay and intelligent youth lived, studied, laughed and played. Where are these girls in the wreaths and garlands of blue cornflowers now? What fate has overtaken them? That is a question for Zalkel to answer. Soviet prosecutor Alexandrov questions Zalkel. Accuse Zalkel. Will you tell us definitely how many people from the occupied territories were carried off to slavery in Germany? I will name the figure, gathered from your own documents, nine million. Do you admit that figure? Will twist squares, lies and contradicts himself. But here are the facts, taken from German documentary films. Hitler said, Germany needs slaves, many slaves. And the slave trader came for the goods. Wailing and lamentation rose over Belarusia. Families were broken up. People were seized in the streets. Colossal manhunt. Men, women and children were driven along the roads, packed into railway trucks, and flowed in a never-ending stream the slave markets of Germany to unbearable toil and early death. This was the appalling fate the Germans had planned for all mankind. The exquisite palace of Peterhof, as it looked before the war. This is what the Germans did to it. reduced the whole world to ruins, these barbarians, to whom nothing was sacred or precious. Here is a documentary film made by the Germans themselves. They were bragging then of the way they destroyed towns, homes, hospitals, factories, power stations. They were certain then that they would not be called to account. Now in court, they would deny it all but the evidence is too damning. Wherever the Germans passed, they left a trail of ruin, misery, and death behind them. They felt sure they would not be brought to book. Kill everyone who is opposed to us, Goering cried. Kill, kill. Not you will answer for this, but... Oh, ho you are feeling the rope around your neck already, Goering. Yes, you will answer for this. Goering snorted and grew rich. These are some of the Hermann Goering factories. This is one of his estates. He was monstrously bloated then, bloated with blood. Soviet prosecutor Pokrovsky spoke of the German atrocities. Tens of thousands of witnesses will pass before our eyes. They have been summoned to give evidence in this trial. I cannot give their names, and you will not administer the oath to them. But their testimony compels belief for the dead never lie. They are the martyrs of Rostov and Kharkov, the victims of the Nazi camps of extermination. The hands of the accused are stained with their blood. For all these martyrdoms, 
for all these indescribable atrocities which you will see, and for many others which will probably never come to light, the chief instigators of the Nazi felonies, the major war criminals must be made to answer with all the severity of the law of international justice. Corpses, corpses, and corpses. The pestilential exhalations of the fascist charnel houses poison the world. They slaughtered old folk and children, men and women, Russians and Poles, Norwegians and Frenchmen, defenseless civilians and prisoners of war. They hanged, shot, burned, and asphyxiated. Death and extermination was their motto. I ask you, in connection with this resolution, did you, Keitel, who held the rank of field marshal, and who repeatedly in this courtroom called yourself a soldier, did you, in September 1941, by this bloodthirsty resolution, sanction the slaughter of thousands of unarmed soldiers taken prisoner by your armies? Is this true? Yes, this is my signature. Keitel was compelled to admit. Yes, it was his blood-stained signature. The Nazis slaughtered people from all countries of Europe in their death factories. They would have turned the whole world into a Maidanic. Britain and Mexico and Canada would have become Dachau's if Hitler's hordes had not been stemmed and routed. Let the nations of the world remember this. Murder was a profession and an industry with the Nazis. They even turned death into a commercial enterprise. They did not leave even the corpses of their victims in peace, but cold bloodedly turned them to account. They cut their hair from their scalps and sent it to Germany to be made into mattresses. See the sacks and bales filling these warehouses? How many women must have been slaughtered and scalped to fill them? the gold teeth and dentures from the dead. The gold was sent to the vaults of the Reichsbank, into the treasure chests of Schacht and Funk. Here are some of these dentures. Here are gold teeth already melted down into ingots. The Germans turned blood into gold and used the gold for the shedding of more blood. Here are rings taken from the fingers of the massacred. The Germans had a factory in Danzig where they extracted soap from dead bodies. This is the factory the raw material. The soap made from human beings. This ghastly and damning evidence was presented by Soviet prosecutor Smirnov. Here is human skin, dressed and tanned at the factory. From it, the Germans made gloves, ladies' bags, and briefcases. What manner of creatures are they, then, these bipeds in the prisoner's dock? Is there any punishment commensurable to their crimes? No, no punishment is fit enough for them. In their final speeches, the prosecutors demanded stern retribution. 
the American prosecutor said, if these men are to be declared innocent, then there was no war, no massacres, and no crimes. The British prosecutor said, they slaughtered 12 million people. For such a crime, they might with every justice have been executed without trial or investigation. The French prosecutor said, when messieurs the judges retired to consider their verdict, they must in their silent deliberations hearken to the blood of the innocent crying for retribution. The Soviet prosecutor said, I appeal to the court to pronounce on all the accused without exception the supreme penalty, death. Such a verdict will be hailed with satisfaction by all progressive mankind. All the speeches have been made, all the witnesses have been heard, all the pros and cons have been argued. The judges retire to consider their verdict. Ten months the International Military Tribunal sat. It carefully studied the countless evidence. It attentively listened to the numerous witnesses. It weighed the guilt of each of the accused in the scales of justice. And after mature deliberation, the judges pronounced their verdict. Fascism stands exposed and convicted. The fascist aggressors are condemned as malignant foes of humanity, peace and progress. Such is the verdict of history. Such is the fate that awaits all that take up the sword against the peace and tranquility of mankind. The court passed sentence of death by hanging on Goering, Ribbentrop, Keitel, Rosenberg, Kaltenbrunner, Jodl, Frank, Frick, Saukel, Streicher, Seisingwart, and in absentia, Bormann. Sentence of lifelong imprisonment on Hess, Funk, and Reda. 20 years imprisonment on Schirach and Speer. 15 years imprisonment on Neurath. 10 years imprisonment on Dönitz. Acquitted were Schacht, Papen and Fritsche. The SS, SD and Gestapo were declared criminal organizations. The Soviet member of the tribunal, General Nikitchenko, entered a dissenting opinion. He requested it to be recorded in the protocol that he disagreed with a verdict passed on Schacht, Papen and Fritsche. They should be condemned, not acquitted. He disagreed with the sentence passed on Hess. It should be death, not life imprisonment. General Nikitchenko also disagreed with the tribunal's decision regarding the Reich's government, the general staff, and the high command. They should be declared criminal organizations. This opinion of the Soviet representative were shared by progressive men and women the world over. So ended the labors of the Tribunal of the Nations, the Tribunal of History. The sword of justice descended on the heads of the warmongers. On the night of October the 15th to 16th, 1946, in the prison of Nuremberg, the sentence was carried into effect. This act was drawn up by the representatives of the Four Power Commission and the medical experts who witnessed the execution. It was signed by the representatives of America, the United Kingdom, the USSR and France. Justice has been done.
The sentence of the nations has been carried out. The miscreants have been hanged. Now they are nothing but lifeless corpses. Rippentrop, Keitel, Kaltenbrunner, Yodel, Frank, Frick, Rosenberg, Zalke, Streicher, Zeisinkwart. Hermann Goering committed suicide by poisoning two hours before the execution. The bodies of the executed men, together with the body of Goering, were cremated and their ashes secretly dispersed to the winds. Their ashes have been dispersed to the winds. Mankind may now breathe more freely. Let the Nuremberg trial be a stern warning to all warmongers. Let it serve cause of worldwide peace, of an enduring and democratic peace.